I'm Theodora Scarato, Executive Director of Environmental Health Trust, and I'm here with Erica Rosenberg. She's an attorney who retired from the FCC as Assistant Chief at the Competition and Infrastructure Policy Division in 2021. She has 20 plus years of work on the Hill in federal agencies plus academia, and her work history includes not only the FCC, but also work at the House Resources and Senate Energy Committees. She has worked as an attorney in EPA's Office of General and Regional Councils, who just published an article in Environment Science and Policy for Sustainable Development entitled Environmental Procedures at the FCC, a case study in corporate capture about how the FCC has not fulfilled its duties under NEPA in a myriad of ways. And I thought to start, we would begin with what is NEPA? How does it work? Thanks, Theodora. Let's talk about NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Enacted in 1970, it's an act that requires agencies to consider and disclose the environmental effects of their major actions and to improve decision-making and agency accountability and transparency. It requires public participation as well, and it makes environmental protection part of every agency's mission. The, the environmental impacts of a project that are to be considered include the effects of antennas, poles, fencing, roads, fiber and power connections, operation and maintenance. It's not just the small cell that's there or a short tower. It's the whole project footprint. So mm -hmm. guy wires might be built and secured in a wetland, but the tower itself is not in a wetland. So as a procedural statute, NEPA does not mandate an outcome, but it does allow for improving an action that an agency is taking. And um, it sets out a process that allows mitigation of that action. And the agencies adopt their own NEPA procedures and the whole system is overseen by the Council on Environmental Quality, which is a White House office. And they approve agency rules and ensure that agencies are complying with NEPA. Each of us all across this great land has a stake in maintaining and improving environmental quality, clean air and clean water, the wise use of our land, the protection of wildlife and natural beauty, parks for all to enjoy. These are part of the birthright of every American. To guarantee that birthright, we must act and act decisively. It is literally now or never. During the past three years, we have made a good start. We have passed new laws to protect the environment, and we have mobilized the power of public concern. But there is much yet to be done. So what does NEPA have to do with the FCC? Well, like every federal agency, the FCC is required to comply with NEPA. And NEPA has three levels of review. It has an environmental impact statement for actions that will have significant effects on the environment, like a dam. It has environmental assessments, which are used to determine whether an action is going to have a significant effect. So it's a potentially significant effect. It triggers a lesser degree of review. And it has finally a categorical exclusion, which is a category of actions like painting buildings or removing brush that have been determined by the agency to be individually and cumulatively not to have any environmental effect. And you can have lots of um, categories of actions that are removed from the category when there's something called extraordinary circumstances. Those are special circumstances that make an action that normally would be categorically excluded um, uh, potentially harmful to the environment. Um, and those extraordinary circumstances have to do with whether there are environmentally sensitive resources there or an endangered species habitat, something like that, that will say it will make an action that in one context would be categorically excluded, but 
it would remove it from the categorical exclusion and require some environmental review. So what does it have to do with the FCC? The FCC has ma many major federal actions that trigger review. They view their major federal actions that, that trigger NEPA as uh, registering towers. There's something they do that uh, where towers over a certain height um, or that have potential environmental impacts need to be registered. So that action of registering towers uh, triggers NEPA, as does their licensing spectrum, which is when they give AT&T, for example, a geographic license, that action triggers NEPA, even if they don't know how much AT&T is going to build out with towers and small cells and everything else or where, but those two actions trigger NEPA at the FCC. If you have a tower, just you register it if it's a certain height or meet certain criteria, but for all of the small cells, if there are like a hundred small cells proposed in a community, does that trigger NEPA? Uh, that's a very good question. Actually, the, the, the registering of towers is for towers initially that had aviation issues, like if it's going to uh, be in a glide path to an airport or something. And that's why the antenna structure registration system was created with oh. the FAA. By court order, um, the agency, the FCC, was required to provide notification, environmental notification of a tower that might have environmental impacts so that towers that are um, filing environmental assessments must register their towers. So it's, it's kind of a backdoor way of notifying the public that a tower is being built that may have environmental impacts. Small cells, on the other hand, have been generally categorically excluded. Let me back up and talk to you about the NEPA checklist. Okay. Every facility that the agency uh, licenses or authorizes must go through what the agency calls the NEPA checklist. And this is the FCC's list of extraordinary circumstances. The FCC has a very unusual design for its NEPA procedures. They have excluded everything from environmental review, but for a few uh, circumstances that will remove the action from a categorical exclusion. You're saying that there's many circumstances, or for the most part, they're categorically excluded, except for some of the things you're going to describe now. Like in most cases, it ends up being categorically excluded. That's right. That's okay. right. And something else you should know about the FCC process is that it has delegated the initial review of whether a project is categorically excluded to the applicant so that Verizon will do the NEPA checklist. Um, and by comparison, most agencies have categories of actions that do not trigger NEPA review. But the FCC has excluded everything. Everything is categorically excluded, but for actions that that fall into these the following categories. If the facility will exceed RF radio frequency limitations, if they use high intensity lights in a residential neighborhood, if they will be located in a, an officially designated wilderness area or a wildlife preserve, if they may affect endangered species or their habitats, or if they may affect historic resources, that's the National Historic Preservation Act, if they may affect Indian religious sites, that's also National Historic Preservation Act, or if they'd be located in a floodplain, but they're not raising the equipment and the facility one foot over base flood elevation, it, or if their construction will involve a significant change in surface features, 
and then this is, I'm quoting the regulations, e.g. wetland fill, deforestation, or water diversion, or finally, if the facility, this would be a tower, would be over 450 feet above ground level and may affect migratory birds. Well, people talk about it's as small as a pizza box has been said for 5G, which of course, not only is it often bigger than a pizza box, right. but also there's that equipment that's on the ground and sometimes fans or the noise yes. or yes. the power, all of that just for a quote unquote small cell. Okay. I'm not even talking about a cell tower or a macro tower or these other sites, which are have guy wires or um, require, some require cutting down trees just to, you know, make it right to get the trucks that can go up to it. That's right. And as you mentioned that, the FCC never looked at changes in surface features that require removal of acres of trees. That was never a trigger for them. The only one that they would look at for change in surface features was wetlands because then the applicant needed a permit. So it was something concrete they could point to, but the FCC could not deal with the ambiguity of well, how do we know if it's three acres of trees or 10 acres or 50 trees? And one thing I uh, neglected to say about NEPA is it's all about context and intensity so that a wind turbine in Yellowstone National Park is going to have a much greater environmental effect than a tall tower in a developed industrial zone, right? So the FCC just didn't want to deal with that nuance of, well, you're building on a slope in a scenic area and you're taking out four acres of trees, that should trigger an environmental assessment. Instead, it would be just, well, you know, is it four acres? You know, well, it's only about 20 trees. What if they were old growth? That would trigger, in my mind, an environmental assessment. Um, so that's... Oh, another aspect of uh, the FCC's failing to comply with NEPA. So the applicants have been delegated the task of reviewing this checklist for every facility. Many of those components have separate processes, like if to check that a facility won't affect endangered species, the applicant must do some review under the Inst Endangered Species Act to check if it's going to affect his historic sites, sorry. Um, the applicant must notify tribes and the state historic preservation officer to make sure there are no neighborhoods or sites that are affected. So NEPA is an umbrella statute and it has many processes under its umbrella, like National Historic Preservation Act, Endangered Species Act, many agencies require a Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act processes, but the FCC does not. Uh, one other thing about NEPA and the CEQ rules that set out the process, they define effects extremely broadly, but the way the FCC has configured its checklist, its effects list is very narrow, as are the extraordinary circumstances. Like another agency, for example, would include coastal zone as a, as a circumstance that would remove uh, an action from a categorical exclusion. Coastal zone, prime farmland, um, uh, would consider hazardous waste, noise emissions, air emissions. The FCC does not consider any of those things, nor does it consider many executive orders like environmental justice. You're telling me that the FCC does not consider as an effect toxic emissions from the facility itself, such as the diesel generator or the any potential spill from the backup power or and all of that, that that's not considered or or even what about taking down trees in order to build the the facility? You are correct. Um let me clarify two instances where the FCC would consider those effects. Okay. They have a complaints process. If an applicant does the checklist and decides their project is categorically excluded, 
it can just go ahead and build. It doesn't submit anything, no, any documentation to the FCC, nothing. If they do find that one of those categories triggers an environmental assessment, they do have to file the environmental assessment and the public has 30 days to comment. That comment period is when the public can file complaints. And the complaints can be um, take a variety of forms. They can raise effects that were not considered to which the FCC routinely says that's not part of the checklist or they could say we have evidence that the applicant has not done the checklist or hasn't done the checklist properly because hey there's a wetland here and they didn't get a wetland permit or there was a wetland there um so that's one way the the agency can consider effects that are outside the checklist the other is the agency can, on its own motion, require the applicant to consider effects that are beyond the checklist. But in my experience, it has never done that. So the FCC relies on the applicant, meaning the company, Correct. to identify if NEPA needs to be triggered in this way, that there needs to be this comment period with the public. Right, right. But with with projects that are categorically excluded, that the applicant has reviews the checklist and says, oh no, this small cell is fine. Um, mm -hmm. And presumably it will have done an RF emission study as part of that checklist. Mm -hmm. Remember, exceedances would trigger an EA. Um, so they, uh, they just proceed to build. They don't wait for the um, agency to authorize it in the form of a quote-unquote finding of no significant impact. That's what the agency issues after it reviews an environmental assessment and decides that the project really won't have any significant effects so that an EIS, environmental impact statement, is not warranted. The agency has never done an EIS and has never found that an EA requires an EIS. You're saying that in all the time that you've been there, the agency has never done environmental impact statement. Environmental it, impact it statement. It has never done is, one. Right. That's, which a, is what that's most the of highest us, level of review that you know you do for a mine or a dam or something like that. Or you could do, you know, if there were a build out with a thousand towers, which there are sometimes in Alaska, yeah. or, for example, there have been. Um there is an approach for agencies to do cumulative. Um, effects considerations and do a whole uh, environmental impact statement or a another way they could do this is a programmatic environmental assessment. Um, but they have only done one programmatic environmental assessment. And that was about birds, migratory birds. I think most people think that if there's compliance with NEPA, that that means that there's this public process for every installation where all of the possible effects have been looked at and evaluated and so forth. But actually what's happening is most are categorically excluded. And you're saying there's only one time where there's been a full environmental impact statement done. No, never a full environmental never. impact statement. Never. Environmental uh, assessment. I'm sorry, programmatic environmental assessment, which is the whole program. It's sort of a step below an EIS. Okay. <laughs> so, and most of those projects that are categorically excluded, there's no record of anything at the agency. They don't have to submit. The applicants, Verizon, AT&T, don't have to submit documentation to the agency that they're building small cells or short poles or whatever it is they're building. There's just no record of it. So they rely on the companies to do it and then there's no record of it and there's no oversight of whatever there is no record of. Right, and there's no way to track those at the agency either. Well, if the, an environmental assessment is filed, then yes, the public can track down that antenna structure registration application and find the environmental assessment buried on it. Um, and, and then they'll have 30 days to comment on it. So they can file something. But as you point out, for small cells, or most things that just do the checklist, but never file anything with the FCC, they allegedly do the checklist, there's no oversight to ensure that they do the checklist. 
um, they just proceed uh, to build. So um, as we've been talking about, and, and as I, I say in the article, um, there's just a, a myriad of ways that the agency fails to uh, comply with NEPA. It, it, it does not um, consider many of its actions to be major federal actions that trigger NEPA. Um, it, its categorical exclusion is overly broad and the checklist is too narrow to take in to account lots of effects. Um, it uh, doesn't really track or do much oversight for what the applicants are doing. Uh, and it it fails to provide adequate notice and opportunities for comment to the public. Uh, how else? It, it doesn't really enforce its rules. On rare occasion, it will, but it does not. Uh, and uh, it fails to make environmental documents available to the public, including RF studies. And uh, it routinely ignores uh, the public's comments. In 2019, when those streamlining laws um, or regulations were put forward by the FCC, there was no environmental review of this major action of really allowing so many facilities to be built throughout the country, hundreds of thousands. In fact, it was uh, there were quotes of you know 800,000 small cell facilities are needed for to right. fulfill the 5G dream. So NRDC nice. and, and tribes sued on various um, aspects of an order that the FCC had issued. And the court did say, basically, uh, when the FCC tried to eliminate small cell authorization from NEPA review by terming it a non-major federal action, the court said there's no evidence that all this is not going to have an environmental footprint. So... You can't do that. And these projects then went back to being um, subject to the checklist. They're just subject to the checklist. But from what I understand, they're generally categorically excluded. Correct. So although in, in that- fact, excuse me, the, the FCC could have taken a different approach to eliminating small cell review by just saying, we're finding that, that there are no environmental impacts individually or cumulatively, and we're going to categorically exclude small cells, but they did not. So they went for the bigger action of, of deeming them non-major federal actions that trigger NEPA. But it seems like what's happening in communities with that is that small cells are being proposed, they're being considered categorically excluded, thus mm -hmm. complying with NEPA. But what didn't happen was there's this federal action where we're basically fast tracking or facilitating the building all across the country of all of these, right? In every state. And there's no look at the whole picture or the cumulative effect. Right. That didn't happen. Instead, now it's down to each small cell or each application at a time. And, and what about a community where maybe a hundred are proposed? What, um, how does that work? It's supposed to still be on a facility by facility basis, but even the um, carriers would want what the agency used to term batching, mm -hmm. you know, where you, you're building a hundred facilities, then you batch them and do the environmental review, maybe at a high level for it. But I don't know what has come of that um, initiative to enable uh, applicants to batch their projects, but even you'd think the locals would want to look at, well, where are these going and what are they going to look like? But um, the Telecommunications Act has also curtailed uh, local authority to um, have a say in where uh, many of these facilities go. What aspect of the Telecommunication Act? There are a few sections. And um, I guess the uh, you're more familiar with the one on RF, which deals with health effects, so you could speak to that. But there's also one that precludes uh, local authorities from placing an undue burden on applicants mm. who want to uh, build. How do you know 
that something's being proposed in your community that you could comment on? Like, how do you find this out? That is a very good question. And I think it it just requires watchdogging the body that is authorizing this. It could be a local zoning board. It could be the city council. Um, so a lot of those plans need to go through various uh, governmental entities. And that's where citizens unfortunately have to start because the FCC is very much out of the picture um, on a lot of small cell uh, work. And as I said, I think RF is required for any facility, an RF study, but those are not submitted to the FCC. So um, I think it should be possible for citizens to request that the local bodies that oversee telecom development ask for a copy of the RF study, which would show NEPA compliance with the FCC. There may also be state procedures that require certain um, studies by the applicants, state NEPAs. Well, 5G towers are starting to be installed in neighborhoods across the city. And while they're meant to improve internet service, people who live around them say that the towers are imposing and an eyesore. All right, Christine Russo has reaction from Brooklyn. We just don't have no idea what it is. Does it help the neighborhood? Does it help the residential property value? Marion Little, owner of this Brooklyn hardware store, says he was shocked to see a 32-foot tower seemingly appear overnight right outside of his shop. It's extremely huge. I mean, it's, it's, it's really huge. It's, it's almost like an eyesore. Others walking by also confused about the structure. The first one I've seen in my life. A large antenna. A large antenna. A lot of people call me, email me, text me, like, what is that? What's going on? And I have no answer. What it is, is actually a 5G antenna tower installed by the city to bring free, high-speed internet across the five boroughs in underserved areas. When I saw how huge it was and this monstrosity of an installation, I said, what is that? Over in Fort Greene, Renee Collymore also has questions. No one came to us to ask us if we wanted it, if we were concerned. The New York City Office of Technology and Innovation partnered with Link NYC to install 2,000 5G antenna towers over the next few years. A spokesperson with Link says they got extensive community input during the process, like reviews with community boards and chose specific areas that currently have little broadband. If they did a community research with who? Because it wasn't with me. Who did you meet with? And what were the results of the meeting? And why were we not at the table? Aside from being unsightly and imposing, people also say they fear the towers can be unsafe. However, the city cites the FDA's approval of 5G technology as being unharmful. Ultimately, people say they just wish there was more communication. We just don't know. That's the whole issue. We just don't know. We have no answers. In Brooklyn, Christine Russo, Fox 5 News. I can tell you in New York City, where there are these jumbo 5G poles going up throughout the city, um, we requested the RF compliance reports, even the simulations, of course, that would go in advance of the, right. tr the transmissions being active. And we have not received any. And they're going, some are even closer than 10 feet to homes. Is it the uh, locals that are resistant or is it the applicant or how do you, you don't know? I, I don't know the answer to that. We asked the city, the Office of Technology, the entity that has the franchise, they have a franchise agreement and still have not received an answer. And I know many people in the community that have done FOILs. I did a FOIL too, but they've been doing it for months and years, in fact. Okay. People can't get the reports that show RF compliance for these jumbo 5G poles in New York, despite repeatedly asking. Now, in my community in Montgomery County, so I'm about 15 minutes from you, here, everything is posted online. The application that has the RF reports, the oh, technical great. specs, the make and great. model of the antennas. But in That's many great. communities, people have not been able to get that information. They don't know to ask the question. Then when they know the questions to ask, they're not provided that information. And a lot of times it's the the entity that's uh, permitting it 
or the people that they talk to don't even know where to find that information. It really needs to right. be a part of the process. Right. And the only way they could um, pry it out of the FCC, and I haven't quite seen it done, is if they have reason to suspect that the RF report is inaccurate, or which they won't have seen, or they suspect that that antenna is going to be so powerful in terms of its placement that it will exceed the RF standards. But the FCC routinely denies challenges to facilities based on RF, and they will not ask the applicant for the RF study, nor will they you know, obviously share it with the complainant unless there's some reason to suspect it is exceeding limits. How do you prove that? It's very hard. You know, that that's really, it's a, it's an unfortunate thing. And I, I guess more communities need to emulate Montgomery County. They're obviously getting RF studies, but then complainants need to get their own engineers looking at those studies and saying, this isn't right, or this is going to be higher or lower than what they're saying, or this antenna that they've used actually has a, the capacity to treble the emissions, um, and how do we know that they'll keep it at that level, which, which leads to another problem area of what happens when uh, citizens measure RF exceedances after something is built. What becomes of those complaints and how do they go about challenging something that's post-construction? Maybe the, like Montgomery County might be more sympathetic to those complaints, but other places would not be. Well, we really need to have municipalities or local governments that are doing the before and after measurements right. um, in in the way that engineers do to assess what's actually going on once the antennas are on and transmitting. Right. And that's not really happening in many communities. Now, some communities are looking to have the pre and post or yearly measurements that are done. And I think that's really the future of what's going to be happening with all of these facilities is municipalities are going to be having maybe even an in-house staff that does measuring. I mean, as long as there's a problem, a recognized problem, but right now there's no recognized problem, certainly by the FCC. We've covered the continuing controversy in Wyandotte where parents are surprised and outraged that T-Mobile cell phone antennas are being installed on an elementary school. As I stand on the playground, you can see the T-Mobile antenna installed on the chimney of Washington Elementary School in Wyandotte. Parents, we've told you, have been protesting that antenna, concerned about the safety. Today, we are taking an in-depth look at what researchers and scientists have to say. The Wyandotte School Board over the summer four years ago approved the installation of the antennas before these two little boys were in the district. So when as they attended kindergarten and second grade, installation began this year, their mom felt shocked. I never expected a cell tower to be on top of my child's school. This was, this is definitely a shake your head moment. We have all of our federal permits, all of our state permits, all of our local permits, and a valid contract that allows that cell site to operate safely. Michelle Sanders, a director of lease and site optimization for T-Mobile, appeared with a contractor who planned the antennas at a recent school board meeting. They said the antennas comply with FCC safety regulations. And as I said, the theoretical modeling showed that the exposure levels on the rooftop are well below those limits. Radio frequency from the cellular tower is harmful to people. Wayne State Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Dr. John Liu, has studied digital communications for more than 40 years. He says studies show there is a risk. In 2016, the U.S. National Toxicology Program released findings showing rats developed tumors after exposure to such radiation. The American Cancer Society has called for more research. It pointed out the International Agency for Research on Cancer classified RF radiation emitted by such antennas as, quote, possibly carcinogenic to humans. At the same time, the FCC has said such antennas result in RF emission exposure far below safety limits. Professor Liu asks, without conclusive evidence it's safe, is it ethical to put an antenna on a school? 
somebody puts a tower on an elementary school chimney, what do you think that is? Other than greed. They just want to save money. So just confess. They're doing evil. Just stop doing it. And we'll continue to deploy sites on schools because we are operating in full compliance with FCC regulations. Right? The emissions limits were set in 1996 and haven't been changed. Um, so presumably it's fairly easy for the applicants to meet those limits. And then citizens need to hire their own experts to measure and challenge reports. So it's tough. That's a tough one. Again, there's no notice of those small cells. There's no notice and opportunity to comment. There's no timeline associated with those, assuming the applicant does the checklist, or if they don't do the checklist, they just go ahead and build. They don't wait for that finding of no significant impact from the FCC to build. So there's no timeline for citizens to even complain about these unless they get involved in the local process and they can follow when building will begin. It only takes about an hour or two to install a small cell, but approval may take a couple of years and requires navigating layers of government bureaucracy. Small cells will drive 5G, power innovations that will reshape our lives and add $2.7 trillion for America's economy, but it won't happen without new policies and regulations. We're ready to make 5G a reality. Are you? You're saying that they can just start building even though they haven't gotten the final uh, confirmation that they're com there's NEPA compliance. They don't need a final NEPA compliance confirmation if it's categorically excluded at the okay. FCC. Now, presumably the locals will be on top of that and say, have you done your NEPA compliance? Let's see your checklist. Let's see those RF studies, which are part of the checklist. But it's from what you're telling me, that is not the case in most uh, localities. So you're saying that people can go to the local authority or the entity permitting the structures and say, show me the NEPA checklist. Where is confirmation that this facility is compliant with NEPA? If the locals care about that, then they would require it of the applicants, but I'm not sure how many locals one care about it or feel the empowered to ask for those documents to the applicants. I don't know if the applicants are saying, we don't need to show you that. When you say locals, it's there's like both the people, you know, residents right. in the community, right. and then there's also the local authority that could Yeah, have... I, I meant the authorities. Mm -hmm. the authorities may not feel empowered to ask for documentation. That's something that's needed in their ordinance or in their process, the process right. by which a facility gets placed, a cell tower or a small cell yes. or... Uh, what about rooftop mounted antennas? Do they fall into this at all? Or are they also excluded? How do these rooftop antennas, which are proliferating all over in our cities, right. how do they fit in here? Well, those probably are um, deemed co-locations, which has its own regulatory provision and the FCC rules. And those generally do not have to go through any checklist items because they're not going to be in a wilderness. They're not going to be in a wildlife uh you know preserve they're not going to be in a floodplain they won't need a wetland permit so that makes sense that they don't need to go through most of the checklist but for historic preservation because you could see an ugly antenna on a uh a historic church wouldn't be a nice thing right or within the view shed of uh the washington monument i i, I don't know um just as an example, uh, but they are supposed to be doing RF studies. So it does say in the rules that all the checklist items requiring the preparation of EAs do not encompass the mounting of antennas and associated equipment on or in an existing building or on an antenna tower or other man-made structure unless 1.1397A4 is applicable. Now that is historic preservation. And when you go down to that section, there are all these exemptions from NHPA review. But all of the antennas, even those co-locations, are subject to 1.1307B of this part and require EAs if their construction will result in human exposure 
to radio frequency radiation in excess of the applicable health and safety guidelines cited in 1.1307b. In other words, most co-locations are exempt from any sort of any sort of NEPA review, except possibly historic preservation in certain circumstances, but all of them must comply with the RF limits. It's very confusing. You know, it, it's just very confusing and we shouldn't have to be the FBI or uh, environment land right. use lawyer to understand what's going on. And what's happening is these municipalities are putting up, you know, hundreds, dozens of facilities in their area or New York City is putting up hundreds of these jumbo towers People don't even know those those entities who are doing that don't really have the expertise that you have to even understand any of this. I mean, what... I know. And it, I one thing I tried to do and, and failed in the FCC was to improve the website so that a lot of this information would be accessible to the public. And that just never happened um, because in large part, the agency doesn't view the public as its client it views the applicants so why should uh why should they be helping the public understand what is required so that citizens can challenge them you're saying that the fcc views the applicant as its client meaning the the companies or the the companies putting up the towers right. or the carriers right. themselves right well their mission to be fair the fcc's mission is to deploy telecom they don't really view their mission as environmental protection associated with that or serving the public in that realm. So who is protecting the public when it comes to wireless networks and the 5G rollout? What agency, closest, what federal agency has uh, oversight? I, I Well, the FCC has oversight, but it's not protecting the public in my view. Or the environment. Right. I mean, it could make these rules accessible to the public. It could, um, you know, provide guidance to the public. It could uh, facilitate filing a complaint. Uh, it could uh, take public concerns seriously. It could explain processes to the public in a variety of venues, but it does not. Citizens who really want to take on these projects almost need a lawyer just to understand the FCC rules and the preemption issues associated with the Telecom Act. And uh, that's unfortunate. In terms of NEPA, it should just be an open public process, but um, it, it's almost as if each complainant requires a lawyer to file comments on a facility proposal. And that, that doesn't seem in keeping with NEPA or um, ideas of transparency and accountability. It puts it out of reach for most people. And it also becomes an environmental justice issue as well. Who can hire a lawyer? There are communities that are and at great expense. Right. And I think that they should be looking at cumulative exposures too. The applicants are supposed to, but of course the FCC never considered cumulative effects of anything. Like if you have 10 towers going in a floodplain, they never looked at the 10 towers together, even though CEQ regulations require the consideration of cumulative effects in its list of effects to be considered. How do they take into account cumulative effects? Do they do it pre-construction? Do they look at it post-construction in the measurements around a certain area? And then we have trees that might be planted or, or be nearby. Uh -huh. We have animals that are airborne, species that that's their habitat space. Is that ever considered? No, it is never considered as one of those effects that is not listed in extraordinary circumstances. And over the years, complainants about towers have said this is going to have an effect on birds and bees because of the RF levels or because they're flying into it. And the FCC will respond that the RF levels that they set are only for human health. 
and they do not take into account uh, wildlife impacts, nor do they feel compelled to. And they probably say the health impacts are not clear. And and besides, we just look at human health. So they, they uh, tend to dismiss all complaints about sp specifically about um, effects that are not on the checklist, even though the checklist is too narrow to comply with CEQ regulations of which effects need to be considered. Another area that they fall quite short on is aesthetic impacts. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the list of extraordinary circumstances, aesthetic impacts are omitted. Well, uh, to me, what is the greatest effect of a tower? It's its visual impact. And CEQ rules require that visual effects be considered, but the FCC will only look at if it's going to affect a national scenic trail or a national park, uh, just a very limited circumstance of what visual effects might be. But towers can have impacts on local parks or scenic battlefields or scenic areas. So the FCC uh, just basically dismisses all those complaints that are raised about aesthetic impacts beyond the national parks. And even those they, they don't really find <laughs> have an impact. Has the agency ever enforced NEPA regulations? Is there a case? There are a few cases, uh, most, but it's rare. Mostly um, those that have garnered a lot of media attention. That is something that will um, precipitate an enforcement action. There was a, an outrageous case involving Sprint and mobility where uh, there was uh, an internal memo that was discovered directing uh, mobility, which was the builder for Sprint, not to comply with state, local, and federal laws and see if it sped up deployment. So they just started building and this this memo got released to the public and there was an article about it and yes the agency took action there are other cases of towers that have been built you know hundreds in alaska for example and they'll take action afterwards they never remove a tower even though by uh licensing terms i believe they could remove a tower from you know something that they've authorized they could just revoke the license they don't do that. There was one case um, where they levied a fine of $200,000 uh, against a tower builder who had built within the um, range of six historic sites, including Teddy Roosevelt's cabin or you know something like that. Um, and uh, they levied a fine. And then a year later, they revoked the fine or a short <laughs> time later, they just revoked the fine. Um, the FCC did. The FCC. Yes, yes they they were all set to give this company a fine, and then they uh, <laughs> revoked it. So so enforcement is uh, rare. Um, to be fair, the enforcement bureau is uh, stymied by a provision that requires um, uh, action to be taken within one year of when. A tower has been built, not when the uh, violation was discovered. Um, but you know, clearly, oh. environmental rules are not a priority for the enforcement bureau. The agency did start in my time there, um, writing these admonishment letters where they would say to an applicant, "Hey, you violated our rules." And all of those, the six admonishment letters that went out, I think in 2016 or 2017, um, basically it's a slap on the wrist. There's no fine. And they had all exceeded the statute of limitations of one year. So that's why the applicants just got a letter, which doesn't really do anything. So I would say uh, there's a sense that uh, in industry that nothing is um, enforced. So where is the incentive to comply with the environmental rules? Wow. So we're contacted all the time by people in various communities with various situations and towers and small cells and so forth. And I remember one case uh, in Hawaii where there was a, a small cell 
that was being put on a right of way, but it was right next to a protected area, um, a natural area that had wildlife and endangered uh -huh. species and so forth. But it wasn't in it. It was just like feet away from it. What, what do you recommend for a person in that situation? What do they do? Like just t taking it from, you know, they call you up and, or, or if like, what, what are some steps that people can take when these are being proposed near wildlife areas? Well, I think one thing to do if possible, it depends who manages the area. If it's the National Park Service, they might get involved and they have filed a couple concerns about towers nearby. So they're a, a good steward, relatively good steward of the land in that sense. If it's a local wildlife preserve or something like that, I guess it's just appeal to the locals. You know, I, in my uh, experience, there have been very few successful cases of fighting towers. But there's a lot of um, non-compliant towers in Puerto Rico, and there are many endangered species there. Much of the land is floodplain or wetland or, you know, so there are lots of reasons to actually enforce <laughs> the environmental rules there. Uh, there was one case where a tower builder had bulldozed critical habitat for an endangered species. And that became kind of a cause celebre. It actually had Puerto Rican Senate hearings on it mm -hmm. and people protested and the FCC got complaints and and uh, and nothing ever happened with that tower. It just has never been authorized. But generally it is very difficult to successfully challenge a tower, particularly on the wildlife grounds that you mentioned. I, I know of one case outside a national monument, which is a Park Service managed national monument, Oregon Pipe, where the Park Service said, hey, there's a tower going up here and, and we can see it from uh, all our trails and we don't like it. It was outside the park. And eventually mm -hmm. T-Mobile withdrew the application it was it was going to um categorically exclude it and the fcc asked for an environmental assessment and t-mobile withdrew when was this puerto rico tower you're saying it's still there they had hearings complaints it, but the tower remains it, it was never fully built it was the construction had begun which is another issue that's that's another way that people find out about stuff they see the construction beginning and i think that happened in the, in that case but it never was fully built right oh okay and what year was that oh it was over you, many years but i think it was around 2016 2017 do you have any other examples of stories of towers and environmental issues um i think you probably uh, <laughs> have your, your ear to the ground more about stuff like that. Um, I know there was a controversy about, I think it was Verizon towers that were built on Dewey Beach in Delaware, unbeknownst to many people, just these towers went up, you know, small poles, short poles on the beach in a beach town. And, and there was a lot of um, bad press and controversy and Verizon ended up removing a couple of those towers. The community was not happy with those right. installations. Join us July 5th to help save Dewey Beach. We need your help to stand up to big wireless carriers. They place telephone poles encroaching on our beaches. Citizens of Dewey, beach and ocean lovers and environmental supporters need your help to turn our small town waves into a tsunami of support. Dewey supports 5G, but not poles on our beaches. Here are the 5Gs we are demanding. Guarantee our wildlife and families won't be harmed by radio frequency emissions. Release the NIR reports for each poll. Governed by the ESG values and the commitment to environmental sustainability you claim to uphold when it really matters. Grow your profits without engineering a cheaper solution for our small town when compared to others. Give back to communities by doing the right thing. Work with other carriers on co-locating. 
and finding non-beach solutions. Give us back our beaches. Relocate existing poles and stop any attempts to add more. Join us July 5th. Okay, so that that type of thing, like, you know, organized protests, bad press, that's the kind of thing that might pressure an applicant like Verizon to withdraw. But, you know, there are, there have been, you know, long term litigation associated with this. For example, one in California, the homeowner across the street from the proposed antenna was arguing that this was going to have exceed RF limits. And it was a very unclear plan that Verizon had to mitigate those um, emissions. And it has been going on and on for years. So it, it does stall um, a project, hopefully, <laughs> um, if, if there are complaints or press or proceedings around it. Um, but sometimes Verizon just takes the position that... Uh, they, they're going to go ahead and build and they're not going to wait for the FCC to rule on something. What do you think that the FCC needs to start doing to do better? What are some ideas of how do we fix this? Well, I think the best hope is um, that CEQ needs to step up and really um, better oversee what the FCC does. And they are in the process of having agencies resubmit um, NEPA procedures to them. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that CEQ will look at those FCC procedures. I don't know what state they're in or form, but they're due in September and really scrutinize them and say, let's make this comply with NEPA because I don't think the, the rules as um, promulgated comply with NEPA and certainly not as implemented comply with NEPA. So um, other than that, uh, I don't know how to move the FCC. <laughs> it's as I wrote, it's, it's a captured agency and that's a, a relationship that's hard to uh, uh, change. We have to fix it, especially with all of this the, the network, the infrastructure that's being put in. I mean, right we're all at the beginning. Right. So, well, EHT is, is trying to get the RF emissions standards changed. Maybe they'll include wildlife in that, and that would be something that would be part of the NEPA checklist. That's a hopeful <laughs> outcome. The court did order the FCC in our case, Environmental Health Trust et al. versus the FCC, to you know, address in their response uh, the issues of environmental impacts, which they stated were completely ignored by the FCC in 2019 when they decided to keep those limits. Now, we haven't had heard a response. The FCC has not responded. It's been well over a year and still no nothing, you know, on, on the issue. Just that do, are those limits adequately protective? But the limits, as you said, were designed for humans. They're not intended to protect wildlife in right. there are no limits that protect wildlife it's a regulatory gap it is a gap and i know that the department of the interior is a, aware of it because fish and wildlife um had submitted comments on another vast telecom project with the agency FirstNet that oversees the emergency response um uh, telecom uh but that's the most i've seen out of the federal government Mm -hmm. on, on a, a statement on wildlife impacts. This is a whole other issue that needs to be addressed right. in a really robust way by, I guess, numerous agencies with the FCC. But keep in mind, the agency has no NEPA expertise per se. It mm -hmm. doesn't have a NEPA office unlike other agencies. It it's, doesn't? No. No. In fact, uh, I was the only NEPA attorney that they had hired. I had no telecom experience. I had NEPA experience. And I was placed in the wireless telecommunications bureau, but the media bureau, which does radio and broadcast, and the wireline bureau, which does, you know, hard wires and stuff, had no NEPA expertise. And uh, in many instances, were not even aware that the 
Act imposed obligations on the agency. Were you hired to ensure that the FCC was compliant with NEPA? Was that part of what your job was or what? what That's you... what I believed my job was. I was hired um, as an environmental lawyer, not as a telecom lawyer. So I was hired for my expertise in NEPA. I assumed my job was to improve compliance with NEPA, uh, but that became uh, uh, very difficult, <laughs> much as I tried to improve compliance. It sounds like there are a lot of failures to comply with NEPA at the FCC. As you say, in a myriad of ways, it has not fulfilled its duties under right. the law. Right. Uh, just another example, which isn't quite uh, small cell related RF, but well, it could be RF. Uh, they just categorically excluded the laying of submarine cables. They have to license those. And they just said, oh, there, there's like no effect on the ocean floor and reefs. Um, and if there were, it's up to the states to uh, enforce it. Well, that's not the case because one, there are environmental effects to submarine cables and NEPA is a federal obligation. It doesn't matter what the state is doing. So that's just another way their rules are inadequate. Wow. When did that happen related to the submarine cables? Is that recent? No. It's okay. going to be over 20 years ago. So over 20 years ago, they, ca they are now excluding submarine cables. People think that the internet is in the cloud. People think of wireless, things going through the air. But the reality is 98% of traffic goes through fiber optic cables. 70% of the world is covered with water. These are fiber optic cables that are laid under the water, and that's why we call them subsea cables. Curie consists of about 10,500 kilometers of submarine cable, which is about two and a half times the length between the east and west coasts of the United States. In optics, the further you go, the lower the capacity per fiber pair is. So if you take something like Curie, we decided to go with four fiber pairs. It supports approximately 18 terabits per second for a total of about 72 terabits per second on that cable. And spaced out every 100 kilometers along that cable, we have an amplifier, which is also called a repeater in the industry, to amplify the signal. As light traverses through the fiber, it loses some of its intensity. So imagine if you did not have a repeater, it just becomes impossible to recover that signal because that signal is now absolutely indistinguishable from noise. The undersea cables basically started out with copper cables. Now it's basically the size of a, a garden hose without armor. So on top of our fiber optic core, there are some armor wires to add strength. And then on top of that is a hopper path, which allows us to power our repeaters and amplifiers. On top of that, you have a protective coating so that you don't have electrical shore to the ocean. There is no adverse environmental impact from submarine cables. They are made of completely inert materials that do no harm to the flora, the fauna of the oceans. There is a short period of disruption during the time of installation or repair, but nature covers it very, very quickly. But who's protecting marine life? Well, you know, the reef keepers were involved in that um, mm -hmm. administrative proceeding challenging the submarine cables, but I don't know if they're looking at it now. The reef keepers. Yeah, it was a reef keepers and peer public employees mm -hmm. for environmental responsibility. They they brought a very reasonable um, petition before the FCC about um, improving the NEPA rules that was dismissed in every way. And now... As we talk about the oceans, well, something we didn't talk about was the sky, the satellites. Right, that's another know? area, exactly. <laughs> Satellite launching, the FCC had only required one environmental assessment or maybe two based on a peer filing about mercury emissions. 
But there are other impacts to satellite launches, as you well know, including uh, interference with dark skies. And, and many others, right? I mean, there was just the GAO report, two GAO reports, but one that talked about its impacts to astronomy and space trash. Right. And now we're talking about thousands of satellites that are going up. Right. In a scale, an unprecedented scale. Yes. For decades, satellites have been used for GPS, communications, and remote sensing. More recently, constellations of 100 satellites or more have been used to provide internet access, which helped drive a dramatic spike in the number of satellites in orbit. We talked to experts in federal agencies, and they said satellite constellations could have some disruptive effects. For example, chemicals from the rockets that propel satellites into space could deplete ozone and lead to unexpected changes in the climate. Light reflections and radio transmissions could make it harder for astronomers to spot asteroids and study the universe. And each new satellite raises the risk that a collision or failure will create more space debris, which could endanger other satellites and people on the ground when it falls back to Earth. Find out how policymakers could address these and other challenges at GAO.gov. I will be sure to put links down below this podcast to the GAO report and other documents and to your paper that you published that details all of this so that people can get more information if they need it. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. I really appreciate all the work you've done in helping parse this out for people who are new to this or who have towers or who are interested in the regulatory issues and in protecting the environment. Well, thank you for having me.